What would your reaction be if your partner was disloyal to you with a coworker? Today, we're delving into a narrative that touches on this very issue. Tune in and enjoy. I'm Mike. I harbored dreams, I held on to hopes, and indeed, I even had a secret bank account set aside for an incredible dream trip around the world that we aimed to take in just a couple of years. At our employer's annual staff party at a quaint college in mid-September, I saw my wife, Tracy, turn a deep shade of red and then maintain a gentle rose tint as she chatted with some colleagues. I was positioned roughly 15 feet away from Tracy at that moment. I caught her reaction while she was smoothly interacting with another cluster of her colleagues. Tracy was conversing with Rafe Searcy, whom I recognized as the newly appointed assistant professor of English literature, and Janet Barnes from the administration office. Considering it was a Christian college, it seemed unlikely that either of the two had made an off-color joke, which left only one explanation for Tracy's change in complexion, particularly her consistent flush she was clearly thrilled. Suddenly, I had an answer to a question I hadn't even thought to ask. When you've shared 23 years of marriage and 25 years together with someone, you tend to know almost everything about them, even when you're not paying close attention. If you're perceptive, well, just 10 minutes prior, I believed I was in a perfect marriage with an almost perfect partner. Now, I was piecing together the clues of some recent oddities in my wife's behavior behavior that hadn't struck me as strange until that instant. Tracy and I were confidants, romantic partners, and parents to two wonderful kids. Unlike many couples, we were capable of spending entire days together without ever tiring of one another. We could converse about anything from personal issues to historical events, often finding humor in many aspects of these discussions. I've always held the belief that the ultimate test of a couple's compatibility is to endure a lengthy road trip with your significant other, and if you don't feel compelled to leave them by the wayside, you should marry them without hesitation. By my standards, Tracy and I were an exemplary match. Our love life was satisfying indeed. It had mellowed from the fiery passion of our early relationship years, but it had reignited since our younger daughter went off to college the year before. As empty nesters for the better part of a year, our more fervent desires had been reawakened, and we oscillated between tender, loving intimacy and vigorous physical encounters three to four times a week. Both regular gym goers, we maintained excellent physical shape at the age of 45. Tracy boasted long blonde locks, full breasts, and a curvaceous figure. True, she was about 15 pounds heavier than she was before we had kids, but it was all well distributed. On the other hand, I had gained 20 pounds of muscle since my college days. Plus, I had a quarter century's worth of experience in pleasing my wife. Something shifted two months back. And as it was a positive change, I hadn't felt the need to scrutinize it. While Tracy had always been a keen and active participant in our bedroom activities, she rarely took the initiative. Out of the blue, she started initiating almost as often as I did, and the physical chemistry was off the charts. Yet, we weren't making love, it was purely carnal. It was exhilarating, but the dynamic had changed. I didn't probe into this at the time, but in hindsight, I realized that was an oversight. Except when mingling with her, Tracy and Rafe maintained a proximity no greater than five feet while moving around the room. Now that I recognized what I was witnessing, I could see that Tracy's radiance was apparent whenever she was close to Rafe, even with me nearby. Typically, this would diminish swiftly when I joined them, but as soon as Tracy left my side, she would seek out Rafe for conversation. I kept a subtle watch on the two throughout the event, though it required little effort on my part. Tracy appeared to dismiss everyone else in the vicinity whenever Rafe was close by. Throughout the evening, she never seemed to search for her husband. She found opportunities to casually touch Rafe whenever possible. Initially, I experienced a blend of nervousness and dread, which intensified into outright fury as I became certain of my observations. It seemed to signal the demise of my marriage. I almost had to coax my wife away from Rafe at around 11. She looked perturbed when I suggested we should head out. A brief surge of irritation flashed in her eyes before she composed herself, though not swiftly enough to go unnoticed by me. After decades together, conversations during the car ride home were typically smooth, yet that night I opted for silence, waiting for Tracy to initiate dialogue. She appeared preoccupied for some time, staring through the passenger window, until the quietude grew too pronounced. 
she then quickly started chattering about inconsequential matters, like the college president's wife's questionable style. My replies were terse. Gosh, I'm exhausted. I'm off to bed, Tracy declared once we got home, inquiring if I'd come too. Unsure whether she was evading our usual post-function discussion or if she desired my company in bed to not confront any lingering thrill alone, I chose to stay up and watch TV. She looked disappointed. Being a Saturday, the following day provided me the chance to work in the garden, giving me plenty of time to settle my thoughts and reflect. If Tracy was aware of the tension in our relationship, she masked it effectively. The subsequent week at home was tense. I kept up an appearance of normality, yet found myself obsessively tracking her through the Find My Phone feature on my iPhone, checking her whereabouts roughly six times a day. Tracy was always where she was supposed to be. In the evenings, she seemed keen to engage, starting off tentative but quickly returning to her normal demeanor. I strove to ensure her contentment, showing frequent signs of affection. By the next Monday, all seemed well, but by Tuesday, the app showed Tracy had come home in the middle of the day. Fifteen minutes later, I quietly entered our home to find my suspicions confirmed our marriage was in ruins. Their carelessness meant I didn't need to go upstairs to confirm that Tracy's company was indeed Rafe. Oh my God, Rafe, she cried out at one point. Oh God, darling, you're incredible. The strength it took to refrain from confronting them was immense, knowing that any clash could spiral out of hand. The prospect of imprisonment was a strong deterrent. Tracy might profess that her love for her husband eclipses all else, a claim she upholds even though it might come off as egotistical. She admits to an affair, one so enthralling she finds it difficult to terminate even though she knows it's essential to preserve her marriage. Mike, her spouse, would deem such a betrayal intolerable, which is why she strives to keep the affair hidden. Yet, she is conscious that the likelihood of being caught increases over time. Mike has been her reliable companion for more than 20 years, their life brimming with joy, dialogue, and mutual intimacy. The unexpected appearance of Rafe Searcy in her life, just as the academic year was starting, turned her world upside down. Rafe, a compelling presence at 30, tall and robust, with cropped brown hair and soft gray eyes, made an immediate impression on her. He was handsome, though he was no George Clooney. I didn't get any work done for the rest of the day, consumed by thoughts of Rafe. When I got home, I'm fairly sure I inundated Mike with affection. I'm aware that Mike fell asleep exhausted but smiling broadly. I could never admit to him that during our intimate moments, my thoughts were elsewhere. I continued to tire Mike with my attentions over the ensuing two weeks, and then my dear husband unknowingly gave me a chance as he had to be away for a night the following Wednesday. I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't help shaking with excitement when I called Rafe on Monday morning to suggest lunch for Wednesday. Having already checked Rafe's schedule and knowing he was available that Wednesday afternoon, I decided to request some time off from work. Rafe and I convened at a cozy Italian restaurant, where we savored a delightful meal filled with vibrant chat and chuckles. My laughter was plentiful, and I found it hard to keep my hands from wandering to his arms and hands during our exchange. Though Rafe and I hadn't explicitly outlined what would follow, the sense of expectation was unmistakable. He reciprocated with constant smiles, briefly clasped my hand, and let slip a few smirks, revealing a shared allure. As the courteous person he is, Rafe settled the tab and then subtly asked for my address. A mere ten minutes away. Park your car, I'll take as I offered, with more conviction in my voice than I felt within. The fact that Mike wouldn't be back until Thursday night eased some of my nerves about our impending liaison, yet I must admit to a flutter of apprehension. At 45, and after two kids, I knew my body didn't have the same youthfulness that Rafe might be used to. But despite my profound love for Mike, my draw towards Rafe felt unavoidable, and I chose not to resist the pleasure I anticipated, devoid of any remorse. I parked my vehicle in the garage and closed the door behind us. The next 10 hours ranked as some of the most unforgettable in my existence. The connection Rafe and I shared was palpable, and the moments spent together were nothing short of incredible. While Mike had always been a satisfactory intimate partner, Rafe brought my sensations to heights previously unknown everything was phenomenal. Once Rafe had left in an Uber to pick up his car, I was left utterly drained and thoughtless. 
the evening resounded with fervent outcries of passion, likely from me, though I'm not entirely certain. I was consumed by the totality of the experience. You're an amazing woman, Tracy. This might be the finest intimacy I've ever had Rafe murmured as we embraced after our second intimate encounter of the night. I wholeheartedly concurred. Mike was adept in his own way, but what I shared with Rafe was beyond comparison. It felt like we were partaking in something wholly different from what I had with Mike. I felt no guilt for indulging in such a profound experience. To me, my intimacy with Rafe was a separate entity from my life with Mike. With Mike, it was emotionally charged, but with Rafe, it was an exploration of incredible physical delight. We continued our encounters twice weekly, fully cognizant it couldn't last forever, yet determined to cherish each encounter. Mike was aware that Tracy was set to receive divorce papers on Wednesday at 10 a.m. At two minutes past the designated time, my phone rang. No, Mike, I don't want a divorce. She cried into the receiver upon my picking up, to which I responded, and I don't want a wife who's unfaithful. But we don't always get our desires, do we? I can explain. It was a decision I made for me, she pleaded. The one we should talk about. Tracy, I cut in, choosing to end the conversation there. Since you neglected our vows to one another, I too have made a decision for myself. So no, we don't need to talk about your choices at work. My concentration returned. Nevertheless, I dreaded the inevitable clash that awaited me at home, and Tracy did not disappoint. You should have discussed this with me before going ahead with the divorce Tracy challenged me as I walked in. Doesn't our 23-year marriage mean anything to you seems those 23 years meant very little to you while you were being unfaithful I shot back. Her eyes, watery and makeup smeared, revealed her turmoil. Despite my own sense of betrayal, I love you, Mike. My time with Rafe was just physical she attempted to rationalize, to which I sarcastically retorted, a decision you made for yourself. Tracy exhibited signs of distress. I apologize, but I think you might be exaggerating the situation. Could we have a conversation, she implored. What's there to discuss, Tracy? Your infidelities are too numerous to tally, I retorted. I'm aware it seems dreadful. It was a personal choice I parroted her previous justification, my voice laden with irony, which she misinterpreted as encouragement, even managing a smile. I can't fully articulate it, but there's this extraordinary physical connection with Rafe. Was it the most profound intimacy you've ever felt, she audaciously asked her eyes growing wide with trepidation upon realizing I was privy to her indiscretion. Would you like me to recount what I overheard I disclosed my unnoticed presence during one of their recent trysts? She acknowledged her error, her eyes downcast in humility. The affair was just physical, Mike. My love for you is deep. Could we consider therapy? She implored, recognizing the love I still harbored, which only deepened my pain. My affection had waned in the last fortnight, but a quarter century of love doesn't fade in an instant. Tracy was taken aback by the delivery of divorce documents at her workplace. Oblivious to my knowledge of her affair, she was appalled to discover I had witnessed her with Rafe and had proof of her infidelity. Despite the futility of excusing their liaison, she clung to the hope that my affection would endure. She initially toyed with the idea of keeping Rafe as a secondary partner while staying wed. In the end, she recommended therapy, a suggestion I entertained. The first therapy session proved difficult for Tracy, particularly as the therapist, a female, showed little empathy for her attraction to Rafe. Tracy had anticipated more understanding, yet her portrayal of the affair as an overpowering physical compulsion garnered no compassion. Do your marriage vows hold no weight the therapist probed after hearing Tracy's account? They're paramount. But this situation is unique Tracy contended equating her draw to Rafe to an inescapable pull, a stance met with skepticism by both the therapist and myself. Tracy was scheduled to get divorce papers on Wednesday at 10 a.m., and my phone rang shortly after the hour. Mike, I don't want a divorce, she exclaimed as I answered. Nor do I desire a disloyal spouse I shot back. Yet we can't always fulfill our desires. Can we let me explain, she pleaded, tearfully asserting that it was a personal decision. This concerns us. Tracy, I said, curtailing the call. Since you neglected our bond in us, I've chosen my path. Thus, we needn't discuss your choice. I managed to concentrate at work. Still, the impending clash at home loomed, 
and Tracy didn't disappoint. Shouldn't you have spoken to me before initiating a divorce Tracy challenged upon my return, invoking our 23 years together? Those years seemed inconsequential to you amidst your betrayals, I replied. Her makeup, streaked by tears, betrayed her upset, reflecting my own disheartenment. I love you, Mike. My affair with Rafe was nothing more than physical she tried to justify. It was a choice made for yourself I finished for her. Tracy's nervousness was evident. I'm sorry I see your pain, but isn't this an overreaction? Can we not talk it out, she beseeched. What is there to say, Tracy? Your betrayals are manifold, I noted. It appears awful. But it was merely a decision, she repeated, her smile fading as I sarcastically invited her to elucidate. We have a special physical connection. Does it surpass all previous intimacy for you, she asked, her alarm clear when I confirmed my knowledge of the affair. Shall I recount what I heard? You were so distracted last week you didn't see me. I exposed, prompting her to admit her fault with remorse. It was just a physical thing, Mike. My love for you is immense. Shouldn't we try counseling, she suggested. Despite my residual affection, the betrayal cut too deep. Unprepared for the divorce papers, Tracy hadn't realized I was aware of her transgression, much less that I had proof of her and Rafe's intimacy. She clung to the belief in my lasting love, initially considering keeping Rafe as a paramour while remaining my wife. Therapy laid bare her struggle to let go of her desires, putting her vow fidelity into question. They're critical, but this is different, she defended, her passion for Rafe described as an overpowering force. The therapist's incredulity mirrored my own. Tracy was meant to receive the divorce summons precisely at 10 in the morning on a Wednesday. Scarcely a moment after, my phone rang insistently. Mike, I'm opposed to this divorce, she cried out as I took the call. I'm equally opposed to having an unfaithful partner, I responded sharply, but sometimes our wishes are unattainable, aren't they? I need to explain, she insisted, her voice breaking as she claimed she had made a choice for her own sake. It's about us, Tracy, I interjected, ending the call abruptly. Since you've disregarded our commitment and everything we stood for, I've made a decision of my own. Therefore, there's no need to talk about your decision. I was able to keep my focus on my job. Nevertheless, the thought of the inevitable argument that awaited me at home was daunting, and Tracy was poised to confront me. Don't you think a discussion was due before you went ahead with the divorce Tracy questioned me as I walked in, reminding me of the two-plus decades we'd spent together? Those decades apparently didn't count for much. When you chose to deceive me repeatedly, I shot back. Her makeup, now smeared by her tears, was a testament to her turmoil, a mirror of my own discontent. I have love for you, Mike. What transpired with Rafe was merely a physical indulgence she attempted to rationalize. A selfish indulgence, I declared concluding her sentiment. The counselor expressed surprise at the widespread nature of yielding to basic instincts among both men and women, questioning the expectation of unwavering loyalty in an era of high divorce frequency. Attraction exists, indeed, but acting on it is a matter of choice, she pointed out, suggesting Tracy's lack of discipline. When asked if she could avoid temptation if they got back together, Tracy paused, concerned that her truthfulness might reveal too much. I need this, it represents the peak of my sensual life, she admitted through her sobs, seeking Mike's empathy. Yet Mike's affection was unable to forgive the betrayal. I'm sorry, Tracy. Your unfaithfulness is something I can't overlook, he stated firmly, indicating a deep divide that couldn't be bridged. Tracy implored him, but Mike stood firm, highlighting the selfish nature of her deeds. After counseling didn't work, Tracy's liaison with Rafe carried on, underscoring her choice of Rafe over her marital vows. Mike, realizing that mending their relationship was futile, and with the counselor's agreement, proceeded with the divorce, signifying the deep hurt inflicted by Tracy's actions on their family unit. Even as their daughters tried to mediate, Mike was adamant that Tracy's behavior warranted the legal end of their union. Rafe, detached from the marital strife, placed their physical rapport above ethical concerns, leaving Tracy to face the fallout of her choices by herself. Being intimate with Tracy was the most profound intimacy I had ever known, and while Tracy was exceptional in this way, I never saw us as long-term. At 45, she didn't seem right for marriage. I wanted my own children, and she had two grown ones already. 
Plus, if she could behave that way with someone she professed to love above all, what could I expect for myself? I continued my search for the right partner, not mentioning this to Tracy as she had enough on her plate after her split with Mike. Everything changed when I met Lucy Ralston about a year post Tracy's divorce. She was 24, with short brown hair and the physique of a dancer, and we instantly connected. I didn't tell Tracy about Lucy at first, but after two months, I came clean. I knew it hurt Tracy, but it seemed she didn't truly value me. Our physical bond was strong, but emotionally, we were just good friends. When Lucy and I decided to be exclusive, I had to tell Tracy it was over between us. I left my husband for you, Tracy cried when I explained. No, that's not true. You left your husband for one night with me. We were never serious, I corrected her. It was about intense intimacy, and that was her choice. But choosing a wife and starting a family was my choice. He affirmed. Tracy was devastated when Rafe committed to Lucy, ending their intimate relationship. But I left my husband for you, I cried, hearing his decision. Rafe looked at me with what seemed like pity. No, that's not true. You left your husband for one night with me, he reiterated. I knew he was right, but it was still awkward when my kids found out. Mike was candid during our separation, telling our children about my multiple infidelities for the most intense intimacy of my life. The kids were upset with me, but eventually came to terms with it. Revealing a year and a half later that Rafe had left me for someone younger only made me seem more pitiable, even to myself. I hoped they wouldn't tell their father, though I never explicitly asked them to keep it from him. I must admit I have regrets about how my life has unfolded. When the kids came for Christmas, my eldest casually asked if they'd meet my new partner. That's when I admitted we had split. So you gave up 25 years of love with your dad for a couple of years of intimacy with a younger guy. Oh, I'm sorry. A couple of years of the most intense intimacy of your life my daughter mocked. I had no response I merely looked away. Losing Rafe wasn't as painful as losing Mike. Rafe was a wonderful lover, but Mike was my soulmate, my everything. Coming home to an empty house every day was sad, but the thought of incredible intimacy a few times a week was a slight comfort. Once Rafe was gone, I found myself in solitude. At first, I was quite receptive to the idea of dating again. To my surprise, the majority of men who showed interest were notably younger, in their 30s and some even in their 20s, which was quite flattering for a 47-year-old. My encounters with a variety of men were pleasant, yet none could compare to my former spouse. Maybe it was my time away from dating, but I definitely observed a change in what men expect nowadays, particularly the younger ones who often presumed intimacy would be part of the first date, with its absence usually meaning there wouldn't be a second. I wasn't overly conservative, but I also wasn't inclined to rush into physical relations with just anyone. When intimacy did occur, it was often quite gratifying from my point of view, and it seemed my partners were also satisfied. However, most of these encounters were purely physical. I suppose I hadn't been with anyone long enough to cultivate an emotional bond. I couldn't help but yearn for closeness when talking to my children, and I subtly brought up Mike. It turned out he wasn't involved with anyone, which sparked a thought that maybe there was a chance for us to mend things. Despite the odds, I wondered why he wouldn't consider reigniting things with me if he was open to meeting other singles. We had 23 years of a happy marriage after all. Still, I knew I had to be the one to make a move. Mike, would you be up for coffee sometime I suggested on a call a few months later? I realize I've hurt you, and for that, I am truly sorry. I hope we can at least be friends, maybe share a coffee and the occasional meal. I've really missed our talks. Uh, sure, Tracy. That could be arranged, he responded, though with some reservation. I've missed being in your company, and I think I'm ready now we set a date for coffee the next Saturday. Mike couldn't ignore how radiant Tracy looked as she walked into the Starbucks for their meeting. Two years had passed, but she seemed untouched by time, still youthful and fit. Her hair, now at shoulder length, and her form-fitting sweater, along with minimal makeup, accentuated her natural allure. He stood up, uncertain whether to embrace her. Tracy made it simpler by approaching first, giving him a light kiss on the cheek and a hug. How come you're still available, he asked, somewhat caught off guard. She blushed, replying with a grin, maybe not everyone has your taste. They ordered their coffee and cake, 
slipping into conversation as if they were back in the days of their marriage. The talk was so natural that they both had a second round of their caffeinated beverages. I enjoyed this, Tracy, he commented as they wrapped up. How about we do lunch next time she was evidently surprised by his offer, but she agreed in a soft tone. Two weeks later, Mike planned a lunch date, his first in over 25 years and the first since their separation. Despite the hurt from Tracy's past actions, Mike kept a composed exterior while inwardly he was still processing. Post-divorce, he had steered clear of the dating scene. One afternoon, they found themselves at their once favorite Italian restaurant, enjoying a pleasant lunch. Tracy might have been hoping for an invitation back to his place, but instead he walked her to her car, gave her a peck on the cheek, and said goodbye. Over the next year, they had several dinners together, but Mike was cautious not to let it go further, believing it gave him a sense of control. He figured that dinner could potentially lead to a more intimate setting, which he preferred to avoid. Tracy, sensing Mike's wariness, held on to the hope that he might one day extend an invitation to his home, possibly reigniting their past closeness. Knowing he was not involved with anyone else gave her the impression that by making a good impression, there might be a chance for them to mend things. Yet, their meetings at simple places like IHOP didn't point towards a path of growing intimacy. Coming to terms with this, she started seeing other people. Mike, deeply impacted by Tracy's previous infidelity, refrained from entering a new relationship for half a decade. He didn't consider his meetings with Tracy to be dates, although he was aware of her aspirations for them to be. I was perusing the selection of tequila at my preferred spirit store, on the lookout for something new, when I became aware of someone to my right seemingly engaged in a similar quest. She came across as friendly, and I thought she might appreciate my extensive knowledge of spirits. I intended only to be sociable. Planning to enjoy your tequila straight? Or are you mixing up cocktails, I asked, with a congenial smile. I take my tequila like my coffee straight up, no diluting, she answered. Margaritas have their place at parties, but for a real treat, I like to keep it pure awe. A kindred spirit, I thought to myself. It was uncommon to find a woman who savored tequila in its unadulterated state. It was then that I fully faced her. She was clearly a connoisseur of tequila and also quite appealing. Notably, her left hand was ring-free. She seemed a bit younger than me, her dark brown curls cascading down to her shoulders. Her skin was pale, and her striking blue eyes shone a look I associated with Irish roots, much like my own. It wasn't until she asked me a question that I realized I had been staring. She gave a playful smirk as I regained my composure. I could feel my face heating up with a blush. Sorry, I was momentarily lost, I admitted, a bit clumsily. It's not every day I encounter so many tequila options and someone knowledgeable about them. Her smile grew, and I steeled myself for her to leave. But to my surprise, she continued the conversation. What kind of world do you usually inhabit, mister? Tequila connoisseur, she quipped. A solitary one, unfortunately, I admitted, with a touch of self-mockery. Sir? Did you just call me sir, she asked, pretending to be astonished. No offense intended, it's just a habit from the way I was raised. And certainly you're nothing like my mother. She was a wonderful lady, but never had your charm I blurted out, more boldly than intended. Her look of astonishment turned into a knowing grin. She then took a moment to assess what she must have seen as a reasonably well-maintained physique for someone my age. So, what's with the loner label, mister? Tequila savant. She inquired softly. It's been a long time since I've been on a date. My marriage ended five years back due to my spouse's unfaithfulness, I confided softly. She offered a word of consolation, which led to an awkward silence. Neither of us seemed to know how to pick the thread of conversation back up, but then she turned our focus back to tequila. Which brand would you suggest? She asked, keen to keep talking. I'm quite partial to Don Julio Blanco, and I also like Sammy Hagar's Santo. But for truly special occasions, Don Julio 1942 is my go-to expensive, but it's the best I said. After she picked up a bottle of Santo off the shelf, I impulsively decided to make an offer. Mike Mann and I introduced myself, reaching out my hand. How about we taste some tequila at the bar next door, on me? That way, you can decide with more confidence. She agreed with a playful grin, 
and we spent the next few hours savoring tequila and nibbles at a bar close by. Exiting the bar, I had Rose Smart's number safely stored in my phone. The thought of reaching out to her for a date stirred a mix of exhilaration and anxiety within me. It had been a considerable time since I'd been on a date. Pondering potential plans for our next meeting, I toyed with ideas ranging from a traditional dinner to more laid-back pursuits like hitting the roller rink or going bowling. My head was spinning. I was gainfully employed with a decent salary, and I seemed to be well-liked. I kept up with current affairs and consciously avoided discussing politics when out with someone. I noticed an unusual increase in perspiration and acknowledged a timeless truth about dating women wield a great deal of influence, and they know it. Nevertheless, she had willingly given me her number, which seemed promising. This internal debate raged on for several days until it was interrupted by what seemed like serendipity disguised as an accidental encounter with a co-worker named Anna in the office hallway. In an attempt to evade a collision, I found myself steadying her as she teetered in her heels, immediately offering an apology. I may not stand out much, but had we not bumped into each other, you might not have noticed me at all, Anna said once she was balanced. The thing about Anna was that she was roughly the same age as my youngest kid. We'd sometimes talk, and I'd give her fatherly guidance or seek her perspective on youth-related topics. Whenever I was baffled by a generational issue, and didn't want to bother my kids, Anna was the person I'd turn to, and she always had a knack for making sense of things for someone my age. Indeed, I answered, likely with a tone of uncertainty. Anna peered at me, attempting to read my thoughts, then offered her usual warm smile. It wasn't out of character for me to be puzzled. This is about a woman, isn't it? She deduced with her melodic intonation. In a way, yes, I admitted, still with a bit of reluctance. She pondered briefly before proposing we talk it over a drink after work, with a playful warning against teasing her for her drink choice. At Murphy's later on, Anna sat across from me, her expression brimming with cheer as I nervously mentioned Rose. You haven't dated since your divorce five years back. That's quite the hiatus she ribbed, though I felt her supportive undertone. How recently did you get her number? Just lately five days back, I answered, playfully cautioning that I might put her in check if the ribbing continued. Anna's reply was in good humor, but she soon shifted towards encouraging me to make the call. Anna took the time to walk me through modern dating etiquette, offering insights on what she and her friends found appealing. When the subject of dancing arose, and I confessed my two left feet, she stressed how much women valued being asked to dance, framing it as a catalyst in the courtship ritual. I was doubtful, having thought such ideas were more fiction than reality. She wrapped up our talk with a nudge about always being prepared, hinting at the necessity of protection, which I met with a tongue-in-cheek response. Taking Anna's counsel seriously, I phoned Rose that very night to set up a date, careful not to dwell on my previous marriage unless she asked. Despite the discomfort of delving into such intimate topics with someone I hardly knew, Rose was sympathetic and shared her own saga of betrayal that concluded her 15-year marriage. Her experience, marked by profound physical and emotional distress, was revealing. It highlighted the intricate nature of intimate bonds and the need to approach such dialogues with sensitivity and thoughtfulness. The situation didn't get any better when I had to list six different men as recent intimate partners for the purpose of health notifications. Six notifications I caught a nurse muttering to her colleague after she went through my medical records for the first time. Probably a good thing she's not in her 20s anymore. I could have taken offense if she had addressed that comment to me personally, but I had to concede internally that the observation was rather cutting. I haven't obsessed over it, but I've certainly been living up my single life in the last few years. After Rafe walked out post-divorce from Mike, I may have been a bit impulsive. I think I was trying to fill the emptiness left by Mike and Rafe, but if that was the goal, I didn't find anyone who came close. How could anyone replace the 23 years I had with Mike, or the deep connection I felt with Rafe? Maybe in my mind I compensated for the lack of depth with numbers. I didn't really reflect on the number of men I'd slept with until I had to report their names and contact details. Certainly, being sexually active with most of them without protection was unwise and negligent. I wasn't intoxicated, I was fully aware of my actions and always chose men who seemed clean and well-groomed. Yet, 
The well-known saying holds true being intimate with someone is indirectly being intimate with every person they've been with recently. Thankfully, I never had to inform anyone about health concerns. Mike Rose and I tied the knot roughly a year after we first met. We both carried trust issues, but we navigated through them with love and the guidance of a great therapist. After our moments of passion, Rose and I would lie together, regaining our breath from the exertion. After a quarter century together, and at 75 years old, once a week was plenty for us. We'd spend a few more minutes holding each other, sharing kisses and embraces before we fell asleep. To say Rose was my anchor is an understatement after Tracy and I split, I was lost at sea. Truly, I was out of my depth with the dating scene. She led me, sometimes quite directly, and we grew as a couple. While I wouldn't place a wager on it, I felt I might have found a companion to grow old with. Post-divorce, I became more discerning in my choice of partners, influenced by the onset of menopause and the realization that, even though I looked good for 50, the younger crowd in their 20s and 30s seemed less interested. Indeed, with the ratio of single women to men being higher in the 40 to 50 age range, competition was fierce. Had someone asked me a few years back, I would have confidently said I was ready to spend my twilight years with my dear husband, Mike. But due to my indiscretions, that future dissipated. I gravely misread my relationship with Mike, mistaking his kindness for a lack of strength. I thought his love for me was so deep that he would forgive my transgressions. Some years back, I moved into a senior living facility, finding my old home too large for just me. I see my kids and grandkids every few months. It took quite some time for my relationship with my children to stabilize. Though Mike and I stayed on friendly terms, we stopped our lunch meetups once we realized they did not close the gap between us. After a lengthy period of being alone, Mike started dating once more. I must admit to a twinge of jealousy when I see him looking at Rose during family events in the festive season, noting their warm exchanges and gentle touches, which I find distressing. That should have been my role. Was it all worth it is a question I frequently contemplate. The answer never brings any satisfaction. Please be careful and follow our channel to avoid a similar plight. And stay tuned for our next story, which makes this one seem tame by comparison.